Right, by the way. Hi everybody, how you doing? So uh, thanks for, for participating in this talk. Um, how many folks just by show of hands perform splenectomies at their practice? Yeah, wow, nice, fantastic. And uh, how many folks here are, are a general practice? Awesome, okay, okay, all right. So uh, I'm Dr. Shadi Arafik, I'm a board certified surgeon. And uh, yeah, this is a fantastic crowd to talk to. Most folks, I don't find too many performing arms for next week, so it's wonderful. So I'd love to see what, what your experience is with it as well. The proceedings for the talk, if you don't have them already, um, you'll get them. They're very detailed, and so we'll kind of focus this talk mostly on like clinical, practical <laughs> attributes of the disease and the surgery. But a lot of the minutia, a lot of academic stuff will be in the proceedings. Just a little bit about me, I graduated from Cornell University in 06, did my general internship at Angel in Boston. After that, I became board certified in surgery, um, went around the country doing various things in surgery, running departments, started my own hospital, what have you, and then I ended up with a bed triage, started that company, a 24-7 video tele-triage platform. So um, currently, when I do cut, I'll cut either for friends that need help in various states and jump in and help them out. And, and it's great that I can teach them how to perform surgery they can, they can move from there. We're going to go over all the stuff here in the outline. Um, again, I want to be very practical, very clinical. If you have any questions during the talk, feel free to interrupt. No big deal. We'll throw up some anatomy, the function of the spleen, incidents, pathogenesis, signalment, signs, diagnostics, stabilizing the patient, treatment, and then a lot more on surgery outcomes, complications, and predictive and prognostic factors. And of course, any questions you have. So, uh, the spleen <clears throat> obviously is performed, the surge performed more so in the dog than the cat. Uh, the spleen can be come in various sizes, various colors, depending on the disease, anesthesia, individual uh, variation with the patient. Left, left uh, quadrant, the cranial abdomen is where you find the spleen, and it can be purple, red, brown in color, various sizes. The, the changes in the size of the spleen will affect the organs, the organs around it, some the intestines will move based on spleen size. And then of course the vasculature of the spleen here, which is our, our focus when you're talking about surgery. At the end of the day, it's like any other vascular surgery in terms of removing organs, it's all pedicles. And so knowing the vasculature is very important, but of course the vasculature can be uh, very, very widely depending on the disease during, during the surgery. So it can obscure a lot of the anatomy that you typically expect to see. And that's also based not just on the, the disease of the spleen, but also the patient's cardiovascular status. It will affect how the vessels are, are arranged and how they're, uh, how they're acting in surgery. So again, just another, another view of the anatomy. The, the point really here is to kind of look at how close the, pan the pancreas and how it shares blood supply with the, with the spleen. Pancreatitis is a potential complication of surgery. And of course, the, the stomach, uh, intimate vasculature with the spleen as well. So those are, those are important attributes when you're considering a splenectomy. The microscopic anatomy, we'll, we'll go more into that in the proceedings, but this, the spleen has massive functions for the body. Uh, not, not just with the obvious one, which is erythrocytes, anemia, or blood cells, but also immune function. It's very, very important for this. And people, of course, have splenectomies. If anybody's known anybody who's had a splenectomy, it's very detrimental to their overall health, especially in regards to the immune system. So, Partial splenectomies are more so done in human beings, if, if at all possible. In dogs, we don't see as much dependence to that. The liver and bone marrow will take over, for example, uh, red blood cell production, and then of course immune function with the lymph nodes, and that system in the liver. But the spleen plays a major role, and so I just want to remind everybody that it's, a, it's, it's huge in terms of immune surveillance, antigens, um, complement activation, red blood cells, platelets. So very important for these, these functions. So some stats here for you that we'll just, we'll just go over. Um, anything that we talk about in the talk and the proceedings in regards to percentages, it's all over the place in the literature. It, it depends on how the study is organized, what their, what their, um, the collection of animals they have in that study, what they're looking at, what angles. So the percentages are, are all over the place in terms of trying to find some consistency. So you, you may read papers and they may have different numbers and I tried my best in the proceedings to outline them all, but to, it's, it, it is, it's a complex disease, lots of factors. So you tend to 
you get lost in all the details and the numbers are all over the place. So I tried my best to give you sort of a, an overview of the stats. So in regards to splenic lesions, they make up 0.3 to 2% of all neoplasia in dogs over the year, over eight years of age. 5% of all non-skin primary limb neoplasms in large, large breed dogs. You see neoplasia in 48 to 66% of cases. This is, this is general, this is not how many sarcoma, this is all of them included together. Unclassified disease, 0.4%, non-neoplastic, 30 to 80%. The overall malignancy, somewhere around three quarters of dogs will have cancer. And again, these numbers vary widely depending on the study. When you look at the overall incidence of splenic neoplasia, maybe one third to two thirds of dogs, mostly malignant. The most common malignancy, maybe sarcoma. Overall, maybe sarcoma is found in 65 to 88 percent of affected dogs. We do see a higher incidence of splenic maybe sarcoma in cases of hemoperineum. Splenic hematoma less so when you look at hemoperineum cases. With maybe sarcoma, three quarters of cases, the maybe sarcoma lesion was a source of the bleeding, and that's important for prognosis that we'll talk about later on as well. You may not be surprised by that, but that's 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 typically what you see. There's a whole host, as we don't forget, of people who have maybe sarcoma, but there's a large list of, of malignancies you can find in dogs. And over my 17 years of, of being a veterinarian and a surgeon, um, I have I have seen a lot of these. But by far, maybe sarcoma is the most common malignancy. And and you know it'll come in various shapes and sizes. So one thing you don't want to one thing you don't want to do clinically is if you're in surgery is try to guess and then make a decision or, or, or convince the owner to make a decision on the table as to whether or not based on gross, gross observations is actually a malignancy or not. His pathology is the way to confirm it. Now there are of course factors that may play a role in whether or not, grossly speaking, that lesion looks like cancer to you or not. Um, for example, we just mentioned if there's a hemoabdomen, there's a higher chance of that being malignancy versus not having a hemoabdomen. But in general, you want to be sure that Microscopic evaluation is the goal, and unless there's another reason to call an owner intraoperatively, uh, we try to try to collect the samples, the biopsies, and get into pathology to confirm a diagnosis. So it comes in various sizes, and of course, in shapes, and of course, on ultrasound, which is the main diagnostic tool. If you're trying, if you have access to that at the time of the surgery, we don't always have that. Um, that'll help figure out whether or not we we know that. With benign tumors of the spleen, typically they won't have a cavitated, uh, cavitated uh, uh, characteristics of an ultrasound. If you do see like the target lesions, or you do see discrete nodules, but they've got cavitations in them, the chance of malignancy are higher. And obviously, uh, if you're seeing the same sort of lesions in the liver, for example, or other organs, you worry more about metastatic disease. But again, I would urge uh, uh, having an uh, open-mindedness to it, you need his pathology. You need his pathology to confirm. So client communication is a big deal, and we'll go over that later on as well. But um, we tend to make a lot of assumptions with this disease because many sarcoma is, is so devastating to an individual dog that gets it. So it's 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 no wonder many sarcoma is a uh, is a major issue with these dogs. The vascular tumor, and of course, the vascular surgery is all over the body. So. If you have a vascular neoplasia, it's more likely to spread anywhere it wants to go with our blood cells. So of course the, the, the primary sites for many sarcoma are profound and so is metastatic. It can be anywhere in the body. Obviously the liver tends to be the most common location for it. In fact, based on the necropsies of dogs, liver is number one, momentum number two, mesentery number three. But it could be anywhere. And it's what makes it even more difficult if it's vascular is you could have micro metastasis where radiographs, even CT, even MRI don't pick this stuff up. And so this pathology again is the confirmation and surveillance from there. When you look at the pathogenesis of the disease, um, like any other cancer, like most cancers, we don't know what starts the process, but we can at least talk about why these patients come in so debilitated. I have had dogs that had a fluctuating history of clinical signs, so what I expect from those dogs is every time the splenic mass bleeds, the dog's clinical, lethargy, weakness, fatigue, and then when the bleeding stops, you know, the omentum attached to it, or the scar tissue, or, or the, the regular coagulation um, uh, process stops the bleeding, then the best clinical signs are gone. 
And so I'll have this sort of wavering up and down. So a lot of times when I'm really drilling these clients on the history of that patient, usually I get a, a wavering history. I'll be like, oh yeah, it was kind of lethargic two months ago. And then it went away, we thought it was the summer heat. And then last week, same thing, and then today he's collapsed. So uh, I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's what I see in surgery, because a lot of times those often have that history. The omentum is attached to all these he all sort of hemorrhagic nodules, and so I suspect that maybe every time there was a bleed, Dogs clinical. So anyway, so oxygen transport is the, is the main reason why these dogs are are collapsed for a, a number of reasons. And um, the reason, the other reason why I'm going to mention all of this is because uh, it, when you perform your diagnostics, it gives you an idea of anesthetic stability for the patient. That's a big deal, of course. And then uh, DIC, disseminated intravascular fibropathy. Although we don't see it that often, I would say this is my experience, um, it does tie into a higher chance of a dog having hemiosarcoma if there's hemostatic profiles that's, that's associated with, consistent with the IC. So the pharmacytopenia, for example, you have a higher chance of a dog having uh, splenic hemiosarcoma if there's pharmacytopenia present. That doesn't mean that every dog with pharmacytopenia and a splenic mat has the IC. Uh, you'd like to have a quick panel you can, or at least you have clinical evidence of ecchymosis Killer. The, the point is that you have parameters that can help you discuss with the pet owner as to what the likelihood is that a pet may have cancer. And then the, um, the World Health Organization does, as the, the other cancers as well, divides uh, splenic neoplasia into different stages. This plays a role also in prognosis. So, stage one, localized disease with only the primary tumor. Stage two, primary tumor with lymph node or structure. And stage three, you've got metastatic disease with rupture or lymph node involvement, and that plays a role in prognosis as well. I'm not sure clinically they've ever used this, but that seems fairly self evident that if you have metastatic disease, prognosis is going to be worse. So, signalments, anybody here who's practiced long enough knows all of this, but we'll, we'll go through it just to be thorough. It tends to be an older dog disease. And this, by the way, is important. So you'll have clients, you'll have clients that will say, well, is it worth it? Should I put my 13-year-old dog under anesthesia? He's old, you know? And it's relevant whether that dog has cancer or not. And I tell pet owners the same thing. It's an old dog disease. Every dog that has a splenectomy for a splenic mass is old. And so kind of the baseline is they're all sort of at risk. Now, an individual dog may be at higher risk. Maybe there's comorbidities, sure. But otherwise, it's a non-issue in my eyes with you all, they're all old. So it's, it, they're all starting the same sort of playing field with anesthetic risk. And then you combine that with, of course, cardiovascular collapse and hemodynamic instability. Obviously, that compounds the, the risk factors, but um, it's a very common question for pet owners. Goldens, Shepherds, uh, Ridgebacks. In fact, there was a study fairly recently that's been in the proceedings that talks about actually a genetic, a genetic uh, uh, predisposition for golden retrievers to develop this disease. So yeah, so your, your typical large breed dogs, I have seen it in small breed dogs, and I will say that small breed dogs, when I do see them, it can be um, a lot more hypopathic and also a higher chance of, of neoplasia, at, at least in my just cursory experience with, with the smaller dogs. And there's a predisposition towards males. All the typical signs of human abdomen, we don't find with these dogs. Um, even, even on my, the vet triage platform, human abdomen seems fairly obvious. You've done video without diagnostics. You've got the pallor and the descended abdomen, they're weak, they're collapsed. It's, a, it's, it's pretty obvious. Obviously, you need diagnostics to confirm that the cause of this is if you have from a splenic mass or a hepatic mass, but the point is that you've got something improving here with a dog that's got obvious evidence of. Uh, of uh, cardiovascular issues. When you're looking at diagnostics, you're pretty much trying to figure out what the stability of the patient is and trying to figure out if there's any evidence of metastatic disease. That's, that's the point of diagnostics. There is no uh, blood work necessarily that's going to tell you that you have metastatic sarcoma or not, uh, but at least it gives you an idea of stability. So, pharmacytopenia, high white count, high neutrophils, and again, these three factors here are also tied to the higher, higher likelihood of having splenic neoplasia. And then, then the anemia obviously is, a, is going to be a, a secondary sign of this. Weighted graphs are very important. You are looking to A, diagnose the disease. So do you see a splenic mass or a hepatic mass? Is there ascites on the radiographs? Is there evidence of metastatic disease? 
can you figure out whether or not there's a you know globally heart, so maybe there's a there's an ecstatic disease to the heart, pericardial tamponade slash effusion. This is all the reason for, for doing this. And so I mean, looking for the cardiac silhouette and the effusion, a maybe like that anopathy. And so here's just evidence of you know some severe pleural effusion here, there's pleural fissure lines that this is trying to show here and here, and then the globally heart. We, we don't emphasize, you know, I think, uh, looking at the heart in terms of beyond radiographs. You know, we have a hemoabdomen at 3 in the morning, and you call in the surgeon, and they come in and cut the case. Three weeks, perhaps radiographs, no obvious metastatic disease, heart looks pretty normal. We don't screen them necessarily with echoes, with echocardiograms. So um, the, the prevalence of cardiac disease in these dogs may be fairly low. German Shepherds are, of course, the, the, the poster child for this. But we don't, we don't really push that as much as we should. It's, uh, it's tough, and, and you can also make the argument, well, hemorrhagic sarcoma can metastasize anywhere in the body, so what are you gonna do? You can do a full body MRI on every single dog that's got, you know, splenic mass and for any metastatic disease. No, it's not realistic, but uh, just, just move the thought. Abdominal radiographs, so you've got the, a mass effect, cranial abdominal uh, a quadrant here, and it's gonna displace the intestines, it'll displace the stomach, but you know, maybe spleen and liver, but you've got a mass effect here, and obviously if you're losing source of detail, you're worried about, about diffusion, about ascites. Abdominal ultrasound is, is uh, the preferred method, of course, of diagnosing this. You don't always have an ultrasound facility. Um, um, either you just don't have a machine, or it's in the middle of the night, and, and there's an ultrasound available, but so you're looking for that to diagnose it. And then and in people, I, I, I believe with MRI, it's a really high accuracy rate with what the characteristics are of splenic nodule or nodule, whether they're benign or not. We don't necessarily have that great of testing. Ultrasound is, the, is the, the, the best pre-operative diagnostic tool we have. Um, I'm not a fan of, of aspirating the spleen. I, I only see it be very low yield. It always comes back as just peripheral blood or extramedullary hematopoiesis. It doesn't really offer much. I'm sure folks here have done it and, and have examples of, oh, one time you know, we found it from an aspirate. But um, otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the you know, plain radiographs, ultrasound, and that's pretty much where it ends until you get to surgery and hits the path. But just wanted to show you, just, you know, here's, here's a, a vertebral lesion in a dog MRI, and then here's a CAT scan, CT of, of, a, of a large mass in a dog, and probably a pulmonary nodule there, and a thoracic CT. But anyway, most of the time performing three, you know, the, uh, uh, high resolution, high, high level diagnostics for a splenic mass. You know, this is not, not something that you ask this necessarily, it's not realistic, it's unnecessary, et cetera. But uh, people that's going through some sort of a, of a, of a high end imaging for it. We won't focus too much on stabilization unless somebody has specific questions regarding it. It's a whole different conversation there, depending on what you have access to and how bad the dog is. But, you know, in general, you're trying to trying to account the fluids, to large catheters, transfusions as needed, to try and stabilize them. Um, yeah, that's the goal. It, it's a race, right? Because you're trying to pour fluids and blood products into a dog that's also going to be losing those same products because there's splenic mass, there's rupture, there's internal bleeding. So you're trying to, to catch 22, you're trying to delay anesthesia to stabilize them, meaning to get into the OR, fix the problem, and so you're doing these things simultaneously in most cases. If you have a, a, a non abdomen splenic mass, and of course you can schedule a procedure, it's controlled, but obviously my focus always is on the acute collapsed dog, hemoabdomen, ruptured spleen, and so you're trying to stabilize while you're in, you can get into the OR. You don't always have the luxury of having them be perfectly stabilized before you induce for anesthesia and get into the operating room, right? So you're trying to hurry up and do the best you can. So this, these are just a different surgical procedures for the spleen. Um, I, I've yet to perform uh, a, 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 this surgery. I don't know if anybody here has. Has anyone ever performed? No. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's, that's, uh, I've never done this. But partial splenectomy, complete splenectomy is our focus. And one thing I want to make clear here with partial splenectomy, you never, ever, ever perform a partial splenectomy if there's a splenic nodule in the dog. It doesn't matter how benign it looks, it doesn't matter about your preoperative diagnosis, you're never going to perform it. The chances of having neoplasia is so high in dogs, and there's funny function postoperatively is not that important to their longevity like it is in people. You're not going to perform partial. 
You just you never will. I've seen one partial ever done for a dog that had a, one entrapment from a traumatic hernia, abdominal wall hernia, you know, where half the spleen was lost in vasculature. That seems like a fairly obvious, a great case for a partial splenectomy. And even in that case, you still submit the removed portion of the spleen for his path, and one decline and come back as cancer, get it back in and remove the rest of the spleen. So it's still, you're still going to have that conversation with the client, even though that case is perfect for a traumatic splenic issue, but otherwise you're performing a complete splenic, hands down. Um, the, like I said, the, the chance of having cancer is so high in dogs, it's a complete splenic thing. And then I perform a hepatic biopsy on every single case of splenic mass. Doesn't matter if it looks completely normal, doesn't matter if ultrasound was fine beforehand, there's no elevation of liver values, I'm getting a liver biopsy. This is, of course, pending patient stability, but it, it doesn't, it's like less than a minute to get a liver biopsy, it doesn't add that much to anesthetic time, and it helps you with determining whether or not there's a metastatic disease for safety purposes. So I always, always put the liver biopsy. Obviously, if you see a lesion in the liver, you'd like to collect that, and you think it's safe, it's accessible. Otherwise, whatever liver lobe is accessible to you, you usually left medial, but whatever lobe is right there for you to, to get a biopsy, great. Um, I, every case gets this, every case. This is, this is more of a, well, how's the patient doing and how important is this? So um, we, we do see a higher chance of GDV. I have a talk later today about GDVs. You, you see a higher chance with, with dogs that have had a prior splenectomy perform. And so you can make the argument that you should prophylactically hexing these dogs. Also, these dogs are the same breeds that are affected by GDV. They're all large breed dogs, middle aged to older. And so they're at risk for, for, for GDV anyway. Um, I would say with, with this, it depends on patient stability. Yes, for the experienced doctor, uh, gastropexy doesn't take more than maybe 10, 15 minutes, you know? Uh, especially if you have an assistant in UR with you, it's a very fast procedure. But you also have time to battle an unstable patient as well. So if you have a stable splint to me that you scheduled, dogs coming in, no clinical signs, just incidental splinting mass. Sure, talk to the pet owner about a uh, prophylactic pexy. What are the chances that dog will have a GDV at the age of 10 years old? I don't know, but we know that there's a high propensity for a GDV in a splenectomized dog, so maybe it's worth having a conversation. If the client is down for it, you're comfortable performing the pexy, have at it. In an unstable environment where the dog is trying to die on you from every step of the anesthesia, surgery, etc., I'm not performing the pexy. I'd rather have a live dog, um, maybe I can pex in the future or something, but I'm, I, I, there's no point in pexing a dog and then it's going to die because it took 30 more minutes to perform the pexing. So, I just, so that's, that's my sort of algorithm in my head as to whether or not I'm pexing these dogs. But usually when I'm coming in the middle of the night to an emergency lens, I'm not pexing them. They're unstable, they're trying to die, so you want to speed up the process. Other, uh, let's just say other procedures in comorbidity. So, you know, let's say you have a splenic mass, it's ruptured, it's bleeding, and the dog has bladder stones or something. Or it's got a mammary gland tumor or intact female or whatever, you know. You use your judgment. I mean, it's a conversation beforehand, hopefully with the owner. You have these other things that are surgical too, but your dog is trying to die from this disease, the spleen. Like, you know, uh, typically what I talk to the owners about if I'm talking to them before surgery is, um, it's at my discretion. If you're okay with me doing all the things and the dog is stable and the surgery's going really well, really quick, and there's no rhythm during surgery, or I'm not seeing evidence of a before my eyes, everything on, uh, under anesthesia is great, oxygen levels, uh, blood pressures, temperature, etc., then it's my discretion whether I'm going to remove the bladder stones or not. You can go either way on this, but the point is client communication is key. I'm allowed to abandon any procedures we talk about because the goal is the spleen or the liver, you know, whatever the source of the bleeding is. And that's how you develop with pet owners. You can also say, well, doc, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, a dog is 12 years old, may have manual sarcoma, is it worth doing with bladder stones, especially if there are clinical signs of bladder stones before surgery. I, yeah, I don't know. It's up to you and the pet owner. Talk to them about it. Discuss it, you know. Um, it, would, it would suck to do a, a splenectomy now, and then two weeks from now, urethral obstruction from a stone in a male dog, right? And, and, and now you already have a diagnosis of manual sarcoma, dog did great for spleen surgery, not a great long-term prognosis, recovered well, now he's another surgery to remove the bladder stones, disrupting 
you read through it, and they use the knife to stab, that sucks. It's not a feel good thing. So the point is, you talk to the owner about pros and cons of performing concurrent procedures that are not silly, that are not needed at the time, but may pose a problem later on. It's up to you to talk to them, but I do reserve the right, I tell the pet owner, to abandon any surgical procedure other than the ones we're talking about, splenectomy in this case, if I want to. If I feel the patient is not stable enough, I'm not doing the, the, the bladder stones, the mammary gland tumor, or whatever. So surgical details here, um, the, you know, just like any other vascular surgery, you're trying to figure out the anatomy, and it's all just creating pedicles, and then lighting the pedicles, where people get freaked out with, 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 with splenic surgery, and again, this is more of the rush of splenic mass, you know, abdomen, all the stress, the anesthesia, and you have all this, like, uh, momentum that's attached to the, to, the, to the splenic mass, so it looks like a mess, and you've got blood just pouring out of the dog, and so if you're not used to that kind of scenario, it's very easy to freak out, rightfully so. So you want to remain cool, calm, collected, try to identify the anatomy as best you can. The goal is to get the spleen out. You don't have to like the pedicles at the time of removing the spleen. Just clamp them off in the fast, the spleen is out. Because you've removed now the source of bleeding, even though you've got to go back and suture your pedicles, right? But at least you remove the source of bleeding. And you can now hopefully have a better chance to stay lines in the patient while you suture now the pedicles. It's, it's, it's not ideal, right? You like to suture the pedicles as you're lining, as you're, as you're uh, transecting the, the vessels. And then, you know, by the time the spleen is out, all your vasculature, all the pedicles are lining. But the pet is actively dying of anesthesia despite your best efforts. You want to get the source of bleeding out. So clamp, clamp, clamp the hemostats, cut out the spleen. It's gone off the table. Now you can stay with the patient a bit, a bit more successfully, and then take your time, take your time, relatively speaking, to now suture your pedicles, tie them off. So that comes to the next topic here. Lots of different options for uh, for pedicle surgery. I I'm love with like uh, ligature type devices here. Like these large bipolar cotter devices are awesome. It's literally like Pac-Man. You just you just go right across the vascular. I mean, it is awesome. And if you have a patient that's like that's cardiovascularly unstable, a lot of the vasculature is they're very small. Even the main splenic artery vein because the patient doesn't have blood flow. So th these types of tools, for example, like ligature, um, it's only for millimeter for, for vessels that are seven millimeters in diameter or less. If you have a class patient, those that vessels are pretty small, and so you can ligate them, cauterize them, and transect them pretty successfully with a ligature. I don't have to make really sure anymore, I'm out of the loop with that, but a large bipolar sealing device is awesome. You can perform a lot of vascular surgery. I use these for like space and stuff too, it's fantastic. And uh, it, it, I mean, it's, it's a 10 minute splenectomy. It's, it's insanely fast, there's no suturing. Um, but you've got other, other tools, obviously being an old school needle holder, you can suture your pedicle. Ideally you have a, you know, two, two uh, uh, ligatures on each uh, vascular, a pedicle, especially the main slant artery and vein. Um, um, I typically would try to perform our circumferential as well as the uh, uh, transfixation suture, at least with the main slant artery and vein. You can, you can buy hemo clips and use that. You can use the uh, ligating and binding stapler, the LDS stapler too. That's, that's fairly quick. You've got the other hemo clips that are more automatic. It's more of a manual one. You have to load the staple in there and then Crunch, crunch down on the vasculature, whereas this one, um, it automatically will will close the staple for you. They're a bit smaller though, so you have to pick your patients. And then, uh, yeah, and so, anyway, various methods of, of vascular surgery. Does anybody here have a, um, like a, like a ligature or a large bipolar sealing device? So, show of hands, when you perform splenectomies, are you doing needle holders and suture? Yeah, 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 yeah. Outcomes, more stats. So this is again a mess in terms of literature, but it's in the preceding notes as well. And again, these numbers are all over the place. So outcome, manual sarcoma, stage one, better survival than stage three. Uh, benign disease, they live for a very long time, right? One year survival, 85% versus malignancy. And again, it's not manual, this is malignancy in general. You know, three months post-op, one year survival rate of 20%, it goes down from there. Manual sarcoma, 
where it's horrible. So 30% survive two months. Two months. That's a big grim, I would say. Um, you know, two, three months probably, which isn't great. But 30% surviving two months is really abysmal. Um, barely any, any survive one year with managed sarcoma. Median survival of surgery alone, about three months. Chemotherapy can, can extend that out. And of course, hematomas are benign. They, they live for a long time. Most guys probably you know, die from uh, I, I, other geriatric dog diseases, or maybe the original diagnosis is incorrect, it's possible. By the way, when you, so when you submit the spleen for a biopsy, you want to bread loaf it for the pathologist. You want to be trying to get as much formalin in there as possible. It's a vascular tumor. It's, 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 it's got to be for the pathologist. It's very frustrating trying to diagnose these because you're trying to figure out do I give this cancer or not? Yeah, how am I interpreting this? And it's a large sample. If you have some massive splenic mass and you want them to look at that, look at a tiny slide, they got to pick representative samples. So if you can bread loaf it, the spleen, It'll help with the formalin getting in there. So a lot of, a lot of if I perform splenectomies for like your own practitioner, their biggest biopsy jar is like tiny, and so you know and you've got a massive splenic mass. So now what do you do? So of course they'll do the obvious thing. They'll 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 transect a portion that looks the worst and then submit that. Fair enough. If you're performing a lot of splenectomies, um, maybe it's worth having larger formalin jars. But if your pathologist is complaining and it seems that your outcomes are consistent with the diagnosis, maybe you don't have a problem. But to, um, ideally, you would submit the entire sample, bread low fit, the whole thing would go to the lab, and then liver biopsy. Complications of surgery, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, um, anemia, all standard stuff. You can see these things before surgery, during, or afterwards. So, what I've, what I've done, and of course you have the benefit of having an internal medicine doctor or, you know, or another specialist down the hall, uh, you can bounce ideas off of them. Um, for me, it's, it's uh, you know, when you, when you treat these arrhythmias and when don't you, and, I, and I'm certainly not an expert in this stuff, but I get to be spoiled and have an internist or, card, or you know, a, a cardiac specialist there. Um, but in general, if you're seeing ventricular arrhythmias Either they are making up 30% or more of the ECG line or the PET's clinical for it. By clinical, I'm mean from just drop pulses to actual syncope, collapse, weakness, etc. Um, then it's worth treating the arrhythmia. You also have to remember, too, that, he, that these arrhythmias, we don't know what precisely what causes them, it's multifactorial. But keep in mind that something like anemia can cause an arrhythmia. Um, so you want to rule out other things. Hypotension can cause it. So, so it's not always just the unknown of having a splenic tumor and manipulating the spleen, or maybe there's some sort of a hormonal release in the spleen from the splenic mass that happened during surgery or whatever. It may be that there's actual other factors. So treat what you, can, what you can find, basically, is the idea. But that's my sort of rough idea with ventricular arrhythmias. There's 30% or more on ECG or they're clinical for it that I tend to treat it. So the complications of surgery, this is especially in relation to cardiac, that's always a scary thing, right? I mean, anemia is pretty straightforward, you need blood transfusion or time, you know, give the bone marrow three to five days to regenerate the anemia. But um, uh, the heart stuff is always scary. And so these are all postulated reasons why you want to have a heart, a, a cardiac issue with these dogs. Acid base, electrolyte imbalances, imbalances, hypoxemia, ischemia, just a large splenic tumor pushing on the colobin the cava. You could have microembolic disease and maybe some unknown depressing factors from whatever, somewhere else in the body. Maybe if you mess around with spleen too much, you're causing arrhythmias. Um, splenic torsion, if they have that, sure, of course. This is just a reminder of splenic torsion here. You, you know, and I, I don't see too many of these, um, maybe like one a year. But um, and so with the English bulldog, but you're not going to unravel these, right? These are not you're not going to undo the pathologist. You're going to form the splenectomy at, at, you know, at the base of wherever the, uh, the twisted part ends, right? You're not going to unravel it. Oh, close up. <laughs> All right. So think of the factors. These are factors that may tell you slash the pet owner whether or not this dog has a high chance of having a sarcoma or malignancy, I guess. But 
uh, these are predictive factors. So if they have a hypoperlumia, thrombocytopenia, abnormal white blood cell morphology, and in my abdomen, they have a higher chance of having malignancy. Are you going to use these parameters as like, solid evidence of cancer? No, but it might warrant having a conversation with a pet owner, especially if they are on the fence of whether or not, either emotionally or financially, they can put this dog through surgery and all the things that, that connects with that. So it may help you talk about it. If you have metastatic disease, that's obvious, right? You, can, you, you know, you have, you have multifocal pulmonary nodules, while you see lytic lesions in the, in the vertebral column on radiographs preoperatively, that's an obvious conversation with the pet owner. But if you have none of that stuff, and all you're looking at are your basic blood parameters before surgery, everybody has access to you know, protein, platelet, platelet uh, counts, and uh, whether there's anything will happen in there. So you, know, you can talk to the owner about it. Benign swelling masses have a higher mean mass to swelling volume ratio for semantic sarcoma. So the, the larger growths tend to be more benign than the, than the more malignant ones. Benign splenic masses have a higher mean splenic weight as a percentage of body weight. And I think that's true too. I think anecdotally when I, when I sort of kept in mind what size splenic mass, I definitely, I definitely see that the, spl the smaller splenic tumors are more likely to be humanity sarcoma. Um, but uh, anyway, it, it, it is more you know, for conversations. If you have this information, preoperatively with a pet owner. I wouldn't say, oh, it's small. It's got to be cancer. Oh, it's big. It's probably not. You don't know until you biopsy this issue. Now, prognostic factors. So, factors that determine whether or not the pet makes it through anesthesia and surgery after, after the diagnosis of the splenic mass and chemoabdomen. So, if you're older, better survival. If you have a worsening of anemia, it's worse. If you see uh, multiple gross lesions, it's worse. We already talked about the stage of dogs being affected. Stage one is better than stage three. If you're finding that your blood work high neutrophils, low platelets, it's more likely associated with disseminated intravascular cardiomyopathy. That's worse prognosis. If they have respiratory signs after surgery, there's a higher chance of death. So those those are, are uh, prognostic factors for you and for the for the pet owner. Um, Bicapitary effusion, more likely to die. If they're tachycardic, they usually are tachycardic in the blood transfusion, which is worsening of anemia, so more likely to have issues after surgery. High lactate is a negative prognostic factor, heart arrhythmias, seeing a splenic torsion. Again, I, I, I can't recall, when I've done splenic torsions, that's usually the disease of splenic torsion. I don't see it associated with a splenic mass. And if splenic is a source of bleeding, then it's actually a positive prognostic uh, indicator. That's probably because you can remove the spleen. You know, you can stop that bleeding. You've got a, a, a hepatic masses, nodules that are bleeding. You don't have access to them. You can't stop them. That's obviously a worse prognosis. You can't stop the bleeding. But if the spleen is bleeding, yeah, you can remove the spleen. So you can at least stop the source of bleeding there. So key points that I want to make here, um, emphasizing the literature for splenic masses. It's all over the place. The notes that are in the movie the proceedings are very detailed, but think of what they are, it's very hard to compile the data based on the literature that's all over the place. Client communication, hopefully I stress the importance of, of that. You need the biopsy explain to determine whether or not it's cancer. I, I recommend highly liver biopsy. We talked about performing other procedures at the same time as surgery. And then post-op care, I, I don't emphasize this too much because Every, you know, plenty of people here perform philanthropy, so I assume you have uh, ample um, experience with post-op care, but just as a rundown, because I do find that, that uh, these things like, sometimes are lacking when I, when I help hospitals with philanthropies, you want to check the heart, ideally with a continuous ECG, if you have access to that, or telemetry, otherwise spot check the ECG you know, every six hours after surgery, maybe a, maybe a minute long strip for an ECG, you're not going to, you know, you could easily have an arrhythmia between the spot checks, which is why you like continuous, and you can have arrhythmias at home when they get discharged too, and never know it, but if you're trying to figure it out, so you'd like to have ECGs every every few hours, blood pressure, same thing, you want to check the blood pressure for these, for these dogs, uh, you know, again, if the dog is pretty laid out, then continuous blood pressure, 
would be great, otherwise every few hours. PCB total solids, you know, I don't think the first PCB total solids post op was about four hours after surgery. It takes a few hours for the for the for the fluids uh, to sort of recalibrate so you know exactly where you're at. Checking it right after surgery to me doesn't really do much. Now if I have a horrific surgery, whether it's just a dog who's unstable the entire time, just the large amount of blood and all that, and I'll check it either inch off and see if I have to rush blood into this dog or immediately post op. I'll do that to see how bad the EV is. But in general, I'm checking it the first PCB is like four hours post op. And then after that, it's probably twice a day, depending on need. But checking it every hour isn't doing really any good. You gotta, you know, you, you wanna, you could, you could do that. It just, it just doesn't, you're gonna be focusing on these numbers that are, these trends that don't give you much. So I, I'm more of a PC total solids four hours post op, and then probably every 12 hours. I also have the benefit of usually working in 24 7 hospitals, right? There, there's, there's 24 7 care. So that obviously plays a role. If you're open from 9 to 5, and that's when you have to check the PCB, you can't do it every 12 hours. So maybe you check once and they come back to the hospital, once before they leave or something, uh, whatever, whatever you need to, to do. Walking these dogs, um, go easy on walking them. Obviously, they have to go outside and eat food. But they are recovering from major cardiovascular surgery. I tend to say, like walking in the ICU, and that's it. I, I don't want to make this, this 14 year old or threaded dog that just went through a major surgery walk all the way outside, then it's hot out, and walk all the way back in. You're just you're stressing their body for no reason. Have them walk in a closed area or gurney them or carry them outside, pee poo, carry them back in. But you, you don't want to stress out their body for things that, you don't, that are unnecessary. And then analgesia. So obviously, we're very big on anesthesia or an analgesia these days, uh, more so than when I, was, when I was a vet student, which is great. However, keep in mind, these dogs are geriatric, so they're more sensitive to, to opioids, narcotics, and they just went through major surgery. So um, I would prefer to reevaluate them before giving them another dose of hydromorphone or buprenorphine. Touch their incision, see if it's actually painful, check their blood pressure, either, either, are they uh, hypertensive from pain, are they taking part of from pain. If I have evidence of discomfort, then I'll give them, and I'll probably go low dose. You can always give more pain than you need to. But I, the second you overdo it, and you got a collapsed dog, and you don't know, is, are they collapsed because of a PTE? Are they bleeding again? Is it a heart arrhythmia? Are they just, are they just sedated beyond their brains? Like, you want to be ginger with them. They're sensitive with pain meds. So, you know, I don't want to be cruel, but you all seem to keep in mind, I'd rather have a live dog who's a little bit uncomfortable than one who's like overtly sedated, and now I can't tell what's going on with them. So otherwise, they're every six hours as needed, an injection of opioids to try and get them off of it, but they should be off of it within like the, by the next day and onto like oral, oral drugs. You can reach me anywhere you'd like, and if you have any uh, questions, I'll entertain them. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Um, so you said I, I don't know. So yeah, so so I don't remember that study in um what was it? Uh, there was a study looking at limb sparing with dogs that have osteosarcoma. And they found, oh, if they have an infection at the surgical site of limb sparing, they have a better prognosis long term. And everybody said, why? And they thought, oh, well, because their immune system is uh, is heightened, and so maybe they're more apt to heal and fight cancer, whatever. Theoretical, who, who knows? I, I, I wonder if this is one of those same things. That, is that a real finding or that's where one paper found it? And never, never, because they quote these things in papers over and over and over again. So the answer, my answer is I don't know. If anybody here knows why older age is a better survival? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, that doesn't mean to say it's not true. It just seems like the value these things further and figure it out. But yeah, I don't know why older dogs have a better survival. I'm not sure. Because I can't even say it's, it's, it's a maturity thing, because you're not doing this procedure in six-month-old dogs, you know? So, so I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes? Could you briefly describe just your method for your quick liver biopsy? Yeah. So the question is, can you, can you describe your method for a quick liver biopsy? Various methods you can, you can perform. In facilities that I help that don't have advanced stuff, um, then a, a, a dermal punch biopsy is sufficient. And so maybe three, maybe five millimeter, probably five millimeter at least, punch biopsy on the dorsal surface of the liver, ventral surface, exposed to you, 
of punch biopsy. Once you do that punch biopsy, the second you release the punch biopsy, it's gonna bleed. And so you'd like to have gel foam available. They actually make gel foam in little spheres that literally fit perfectly into a punch biopsy, so that's cool. Or you can also buy gel foam that's a rectangle that you can cut. And then you can be sterilized before you don't use it. I think it's fairly expensive, I don't know, but maybe you don't use it that much, so you kind of want to save it for other dogs. So, um, punch biopsy, it's going to bleed like crazy, put in the gel foam, sit there, stare at it, it's okay, and then maybe before you close, take some momentum, and just gently put the momentum over that site as well, let the momentum do its thing, adhere to it. By the time you're done closing that abdomen, that momentum is like on there, just an extra. Um, the second method that you can Form without eating anything too fancy is the ability method. So, if you can, I don't have the picture of a liver. Let's pretend. So, let's pretend it's a liver though. So, it's, it's protruding, it's nice and pointy for you. The process is exposed, not very blunted. You got a, you got a nice pointy, ooh, nice pointy edge to it. So, what you can do here is you can either, there's various ways you can do it. You can either take you can take your medicine ball and scissors and cut a little bit, a little snippet there and then there, so like the edge of it, and that'll give you anchor points for your suture. And then you can do a circumferential suture around that, so you're ligating that part, you're nucleating it. And then, so nice and tight, you, you close your suture, it's gonna crush the tissue. And then you take your medicine bombs and you cut right in front of that, that ligature. And then you look for bleeding. So that's, that's a nice way, if you have a nice point to deliver, you can do it that way. Or if you don't have a nice point to deliver, you can take your hemostats and you can go on here and literally with like one clamp, crush. And so you crush it, what it does is it destroys the parenchymal tissue and it leaves a stronger vasculature intact. So you crush it, now it looks all chewed up, and then you can put your literature around there too. The idea that you'll have now a nice area of friction that the suture can, can uh, hold on to, tie it down, then you can cut in front of it with a bomb scissors or what have you. It's not the way you can do it. Um, otherwise, if you have a fancy stuff, a ligature, Pac-Man, right there. As long as you have a nice pointy lobe, you can grab it that way. If you are worried about uh, bleeding, regardless of the of the technique you use, either gel foam, like I said, um, or uh, or momentum, put momentum on there. If you can suture, suture it. But these are really tough to suture. So you, you want to make sure that you're ready for everything uh, when you when you perform a liver bias like that. You don't need a crazy big piece, you know, you're not chasing a lesion. You just need something just to show just to send it to the to the uh, pathologist. Now you don't want to get a piece so small that all you get is like, you know, liver capsule or something ridiculous. You want to get some meat. But uh, you don't have to go crazy, you're not doing a partial liver lobectomy, that's not the goal here. Unless you're the mass trying to remove, then maybe. But otherwise you just need a small enough sample. So hopefully that answers your good question. There are, by the way, you know, the plenty of surgery books that'll have some arms and stuff too, or you can Google also. It's just a matter of just like, just do it. If you're brave enough just to do it. And you'd like to do it in a dog that is uh, stable, controlled, controlled, everything is good. You've got all your instruments out ready in case something happens, liver biopsy, you'll do it and find out okay, that's not too bad. And then and then you can you can do more of them. If you have multifocal disease um, in the liver, you know, you could grab you could argue you know, grab a few samples, I guess, if you wanted to, but typically one sample is sufficient. Yes? If the dog comes in and you just took x-rays and saw a mass on the liver, is there a statistic of benign versus malignant to see mass? So the question of the liver mass is if you uh, cut the radiographs preoperatively, you've got a hepatic mass. Are there any prognostic factors in terms of the size of the, of the mass or the characteristics of the mass? Um, I don't know. Most of the studies, when I was prepping for this talk, and this is, this is many, many years of literature that have been into this, um, I didn't see a paper on liver masses that looked at prognostic factors for it. In terms of, of, of before surgery, post-op, of course, you know, it's path, um, the margin, say, you remove it with, but beforehand, I don't I don't see anything with that. If anybody else knows any different, you can let me know. But, oh, it's funny, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. So in terms of the size and... Or just if you saw one on x-ray, can you give us statistics of whether this is most likely benign or something? So these spinal spinal mass on radiographs preoperatively, can you talk to the owner based on radiographs whether or not it's more likely cancer or not? So other than seeing overt evidence of metastatic disease or having uh, cites, 
I don't think so. Um, you can you can have the birth of the X-ray that showed up. This one, this one. So you know, it, I don't I don't know if there's a way to approximate this actual size. When you look at the factors that I talk about, we went over in the slides uh, after this about Slunk's mass size and the like, volume of the weight. I don't know if you can, how accurate an estimation is with this. You know, this is a spleen, and this is a mass. Is this big or not um, for this dog's size? And I, other than ultrasound, I'm not sure there's a way to uh, go about it. I removed the splenic masses that are like the entire abdomen, just right, it's a big, just massive. Um, and I, you know, those tend to be more benign, as you see in the literature and my own experiences. So that may help. It's huge. Otherwise, yeah, I don't know if there's a, a, a way to as effectively as possible measure this and and see. And because the smaller ones won't even show up on radiographs, you know, you find them in ultrasound. Um, and if you have chemo abdomen and you're cutting this on emergency, you may not even see the spleen. You just have this, this effusion, you tap the dog's abdomen, it's blood, and uh, you're like, hey, the chemo abdomen. And, and we don't think it's the side or something else. It's probably a max. So what do you want to do? And you go and search and explore. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much, appreciate it. Does our Mac please turn off? Or? Yeah.